So, we're starting. So, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here to the seminar day organized at the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences in this recently renovated, beautifully equipped lecture hall called the Bayer Hall, also equipped with the most modern gallium nitride based LED technology for the fantastic display. A special welcome, of course, to our distinguished speakers that I will uh, introduce later. So my name is Lars Samuelsson. I'm a member of the physics class of the Royal Academy of Sciences. Uh, and uh, at present, I am coordinating efforts going on within the Academy in the field of, of energy. The purpose of this, these seminars is to shed light on the various technologies and options for actions that are available in the creation of future energy systems, both technical, economical, environmental, and social science aspect of being addressed, both from a Swedish as well as from an international perspective. So as you might have seen from the program, this is the third seminar in the series that we call the inevitable transition to the electric society. Uh, I took the first in initiative for this already two and a half years ago, before COVID. Then with support from my colleagues, Jöran Andersson, Harry Fank, Lars Bestrom and others who are here. Uh, and um, then came COVID. So now more than two years later after the original initiative, I think when we look at the programs, this is as up to date and as important as it ever was two, two and a half years ago. Also, you can see that these topics like we're talking about today with the energy efficiency is extremely much in the media and the discussion among both politicians among the general, general population. Uh, the first seminar that we held sometimes in the middle of May uh, had the title Fossil Free Electricity Production. And the second one was in early June on the theme of energy storage, both with great, great presentations that you can look at if you go into the www.kva.se. So today's theme is, as I said, energy efficiency. That is, as we said, really dominating the news media and all the discussions on on television, on our media uh, every day uh, right now. So the format of the sessions here is that each of our three distinguished speakers have uh, 35 minutes of presentation and then 10 minutes for uh, questions and answers and, and discussions. I've also been asked to make everyone aware of that this super modern hall has a very efficient audio collection system, which means that we don't need microphones, but Anything that is being said or whispered or whatever one can do in the lecture hall will be recorded and then be available to the, to the world after today's session. So be careful. And also, please, which I hadn't properly done, switch off these cell phones before the sessions really start. So with that, I get to uh, my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor Umesh Mishra from University of California, Santa Barbara. He's a professor in electrical and computer engineering. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, fellow of IEEE, and many other things. <laughs> uh, Professor Mishra received his Bachelor of Technology at the Indian Institute of Technology in Kanpur. He got his Master of Science at Lehigh University and the PhD at Cornell University under the famous Lester Eastman, uh, already then in, in, in this field. So uh, Dr. Mishra is one of the dominants in this important field of what we call three nitride materials, and he has a dominant contribution, not only to the topic of today, but already he was very early in, in the development of the, the LED technology, in display technology, but today primarily in, in the fields of, of power transistors and RF transistor technology. He's also the, the founder and the CTO of a highly successful Californian electronics company called Transform. Maybe that will also appear in the presentation. So we very much look forward to your, your talk about power and RF electronics. Please. Thank you, Lars. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Lars, again. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to this uh, amazing setting. And it's an honor and a privilege to be here. And so I'd like to give you a general talk. It'll be 
kind of a little bit high level because I didn't know how to target it. Uh, but, um, um, well, let's see. If you don't like it, boo. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I'll be talking about efficient power in RF electronics. Uh, so why, why is the efficiency important? If you plot uh, just power consumption versus the GDP per capita, the one uh, positive correlation is the use of energy per person. And you will see that that's, if, you, if you look at this thing, you, uh, up and to the right means more energy and more a wealthier the nation, all right? So, of course, we want the whole world to be wealthy. We don't want, uh, we want poor nations to get wealthy as well, but you can't do that without energy efficiency, otherwise we will not be able to provide the amount of energy needed to actually develop the world. So, this can be done, though. Uh, if you look at California, this is just the refrigerator use in California, okay? And if you look at the number, the energy consumption in kilowatt hours per year, and the price of a refrigerator, there's a very simple aspect. And what you see is that from the year 1972 to the year, from 1972 down to 2010, and it keeps going on this way, you find out that both the energy consumption, the energy consumption has actually dropped per year, and the volume of the refrigerator has remained the same. So you've actually dropped the energy use by a factor of four. And this is, so even though the, the population of California has gone from 12 million to 30 million, the amount of energy used in refrigerators in California has not changed in the last 30 years. Efficiency is the only reason this has happened. Better technology, better efficiency, okay? So this can be done. It's just an example of what can be done. But technology is the answer, and what I'd like to convey to you today that gallium nitride, this material of, which is amazing, which is actually in the screen that you're seeing, all this, the LED screen that is in front of you, gallium nitride is the semiconductor to address functionality with high efficiency. And the reason we say that is the following. A semiconductor technology has to be high performance, okay, based on application. It has to be very reliable. It has to have a roadmap for lower cost with every generation. Cost is a real premium. You must reduce cost to have widespread adoption. We wouldn't have this large screen in front of us if the LED was not a penny a piece, or a centerpiece. It wouldn't be there, all right? It, and, the lo and low cost requires very wide market penetration. I hate to be in an August setting like this and talk about cost, but unfortunately that's mm. life, okay? And so gallium nitride more than many, any other semiconductor satisfies all these requirements. And why? Because not only does gallium nitride address the issues I'm gonna be talking about today, which is that of photonics, uh, of electronics, both power and RF, it has a vast ecosystem already in place, that of LEDs, lasers, and so on and so forth. And this bigger ecosystem drives the prices down. Mm -hmm. All right. So now, the broad-based applications, we, I call this gallium nitride a future-proof semiconductor, okay? And why do I say that? Look at where you have basically solid-state lighting. We all know about solid-state lighting. Airborne radar, here's an example of a Saab with a gallium nitride electronics in the radar. Data center power supplies, the world is just consuming tons of power and power supplies, 5G base stations, displays, home energy systems. This is basically uh, where you store the energy from the solar energy that is generated in your house, and of course, electric vehicles. This is the big, huge market opportunity going forward. And of course, we have the expert here who will tell us everything about it. So how, how does planar, what is gallium nitride? Gallium nitride is grown, is a material, it's a foreign material. It doesn't exist, let me, sorry. It doesn't exist in, in, uh, on Earth as a natural compound. Silicon carbide does, gallium nitride doesn't. It's a synthesized compound. So how do you synthesize this material? You basically put gallium and nitrogen sources onto a, any foreign substrate. How does that work? The way it works is much like you see this dew on a leaf. When water first drops on a leaf, you get few drops here, right? A few drops here and there. And these we call grains in semiconductor technology. A few of these grains merge and they become bigger grains. And then finally, you see this is a very big grain and very soon you'll have a sheet of water on your leaf. 
This is exactly what we do in gallium nitride. We start with grains, let the grains grow out, and then you get a planar film. And that's basically, but of course, at the, as opposed to a leaf, when these two grains merge that I'm pointing to here, you get what is called a dislocation, which is a, a fault in the film. But what is, a, what is remarkable about gallium nitride? What's remarkable about gallium nitride is even though we have the fault in the film that you see here, which where these two grains have merged and it's like a fence where the two uh, boundaries meet, even though it is a defective material, we get lasers, LEDs, RF devices, all from this material that looks unbelievable, okay? If I build this material, which I do, I would never send a picture of this to my mom because she'll say, you're wasting your time because this looks bad, it shouldn't work, but it does. And that's what's amazing about uh, gallium nitride. And why is it? Because you can always engineer around a defect or a problem if the problem doesn't change on you. It's very difficult to engineer around a variable. And the nice thing about the dislocation in gallium nitride is that once it is generated, yes, I don't want it, but once it's generated, it's fixed. So now I can engineer around a fixed problem. And that's why it works. And so we're very excited about this. And let's quickly look at photonics first. Mm -hmm. And this is basically with my colleagues, Shuji Nakamura, who was here uh, receiving a Nobel Prize, and Steve Dunbar, Jim Speck, and others. So LEDs, no I'll go through this in three minutes. LEDs, light savings in the US from 0.1 lumens per watt, of, which is basically an oil lamp, to 300 lumens per watt, which is what an LED does today. And if you're a light bulb is 16 lumens per watt and a fluorescent lamp about 70 lumens per watt. So from a fluorescent lamp, which is full of mercury, to a benign gallium nitride, which is good for the environment, you get better efficiency and less toxicity, and you eliminate uh, a, a ton of carbon dioxide, we know this. But there is more to it than that. You can actually architecturally enhance your life. Decorative lighting, automobile lighting, agriculture, indoor lighting. And in agriculture, this is a big deal coming going forward because one of the most precious resources in the world going forward is not going to be oil, it's going to be water. And one of the things that is going to happen is you're now going to build basically farms in, in, in basically closed spaces where you will feed the water to the plant and tailor the light to maximize the growth of the plant because the plant is green. It doesn't need other crazy uh, wavelengths of light. You know what it wants, right? So basically you give it the, the light it wants, it grows fast and you give it the nutrients it needs. So this is basically going to be a big uh, opportunity going forward and it'll be done with gallium nitride LEDs because gallium nitride LEDs cover the full spectrum all the way from UV to infrared in the same material system, okay? You can communicate with gallium nitride lasers, you can communicate in cars. If you're driving with a car, you can actually send out bits of information with the laser. You can actually have a communication while the same unit is providing you light. So uh, a bulb like this could actually be providing you information because it'll switch faster than your eye can uh, register. So the same bulb can give you light and communications. That's going to be the future. Uh, laser lighting for cars, you get a throw of about a kilometer instead of LEDs, which is 200 meters. So that goes to safety. I'm just giving you a general feel of what one material system is doing for us. You'll see a lot more of this going forward. UV LEDs have now become the rage because of COVID pandemic. This the, the market for UV LEDs has exploded because it gives you a very easy way of actually um, nullifying uh, surfaces. Okay, because of all these amazing applications, the LED, the transformation, the speed of te technology development, which is the key to indicate the probability of success and market penetration is only due to high reliability and price reduction. There's no other reason for markets to adopt. And the rapid adoption of LEDs is the fast, one of the fastest technological sh shifts in uh, human history. So that's the LED. Now, can I actually ride on the coattails of the LED success? And that's where gallium nitride electronics comes in. It is actually in the wake of the um, photonics phenomenon. 
it's electronics without the waste. So what are the mega trends driving growth for GAN? One is smartphones, okay? Um, there are going to be 500 million 5G handsets in 2021, uh, was in 2021, and going go forward is just going to balloon, and there's, there, there are going to be as many handsets, more handsets than the number of people in the world. These will be several billion. There are going to be 30 million electric vehicles, not in 2025, probably by 2020, and uh, you know the speaker will uh, following us will be uh, telling us more about that. And these electric vehicles will need onboard chargers, power converters, power inverters. All electric vehicles will not exist without power electronics. So the whole transformation to an electric transportation system is contingent on power electronics. And then there's an infrastructure market here, which is for 5G. This is, I'm talking about phones. This is the infrastructure, like the Ericsson's of the world will be basically looking at gallium nitride in the cell phone. These base stations exist today with gallium nitride inside. It's the only base stations being deployed uh, for 5G. Okay, this is huge. So the problem, what's the problem? What's the problem, okay? Mm -hmm. Is we are burning just too many watts, okay? And the thing is that if you look at the electricity generation in the US, 10% of the electricity that we actually generate in the US is lost in the conversion process. What is the conversion process? So you have electricity that comes out of the wall as an outlet, but it comes as 230 volts AC. Now you convert that to DC for your laptop. That conversion process is inefficient. It's about 10% of loss right there, okay? So you add every adapter and your, so that these losses are not losses in transmission, it's losses in conversion. So it's just a waste, okay? So, and so we must tackle this problem. There are other problems to tackle. I'm not trying to overemphasize this, but it's, we must tackle it because it is about $40 billion worth of energy lost per year. And it's about 318 coal power plants equivalents. Think about that. There's, those are the power plants that are just generating power and carbon dioxide to just feed the losses in the power conversion. All right, it's a terrible problem. So why is there? Why is this a problem? The problem is that power conversion is inefficient. Why? Because if you take the old time switch, you turn the switch on or off. This switch is super efficient, but it, it's dumb. Okay, it can't do anything, it turns on and off. But if you want to dim the lights, then what you have to do is you have to put some electronics in it. And so if I want to change, say for example, the amplitude of a signal, if I want to dim the light, I want to reduce the amount of voltage that goes to the signal. How do I do that? The way I do that is with what is called pulsed width modulation. It's just a modulation scheme, which if I turn the device on and off, I can get an arbitrary red shaped waveform, which has the right voltage to the light to dim it or make it brighter. This requires devices to switch on and off. But when the device is on, what happens? When the device is on, what you really want is in the off state, you want the, the, the switch to be a perfect insulator and in the on state, you want to be a metal. So you need a switch that can switch between an insulator and a metal. And the way you can do that is by using gallium nitride. Gallium nitride basically can have very low on resistance. That means when the device is on, it, can, it, is, it looks like a metal. And when the device is off, it looks like an insulator. So gallium nitride, is a semiconductor device that can be controlled, that can actually switch between on and off most efficiently. So look at, let's con compare two materials systems here. Whoops, sorry. One is gallium nitride and the other is silicon carbide. Gallium nitride has a mobility of 1,000. What is, uh, sorry, uh, 2,000. What is mobility? Mobility is the ability of an electron to move in the crystal. Or in other words, higher the mobility, lower the resistance to current flow and lower the loss. So this number has to be high. And look at the number here, 2,000, compared to say 500 for silicon carbide, and silicon is 1,000. That's in the on state. In the off state, what you want to do, you want to hold a lot of voltage. 
and to hold a lot of voltage, your breakdown field, that means how much electric field you can apply before the material breaks, that has to be as high as possible. And in gallium nitride, this number is 21 compared to three in silicon. If you combine the need for low losses in the on state and high breakdown field, the answer turns out to be gallium nitride, right there. So now, what do we do with gallium nitride? How do we make this device? It looks like a MOSFET. If you look at a MOSFET, which is a trillion dollar industry today, everything in, that you're carrying around in your phone made, is made out of silicon MOSFETs. Silicon MOSFETs has sources of electrons and drains of electrons. So an electron can move from the source to the drain and it is modulated by the gate, it's turned on and off. In fact, I hate to tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, your whole life is controlled by switches. Okay, and that's all your life is. You turn on your phone, you communicate, things are turning on and off, that's it. We are in a digital world and the whole life, your whole life is controlled by just switches. So what you want to do is if you want to make us, if you want to improve efficiency, improve the efficiency of the switch, whatever be the switch. So now I'm saying that this switch, which is a silicon MOSFET, is now going to become a new switch, which is, gallium nitride with aluminum gallium nitride. These are materials that can grow on each other. And this, these electrons have extremely high mobility, which means low loss. So this is basically the trick of making gallium nitride so uh, wonderful. So the, what are the US energy savings by 2041 in this technology? Holy mackerel, I'm so slow. Okay, I better move on. So if you look at the amount of, where do we save uh, energy? We save energy in motors, in information and communication technology, in e-mobility, and renewable energy. And the numbers you're thinking, uh, you're seeing are 65 terawatt hours, 81 terawatt hours, all these large terawatt hours, right? This is in the US. If you look at India, which is another country that is now developing and will reach developed status. You also see that in, 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 in an established large economy like America, you had tens of terawatt hours in each of these segments. In India, you again have these numbers coming up. 68, 63, 187, large numbers of terawatt hours that are saved. Doing what? S doing things like motors, moving things. And here you're converting AC to AC, that means you're driving refrigerators, you're driving cars, and so on and so forth. In a car, you're converting a battery to an AC to drive the motor. In a, in, in a regular air conditioner, you're driving AC in, AC out. In renewable energy, you're getting DC from the solar cell, converting it to AC that you need for the house. For an power supply for the data server, you're taking AC in, converting it to DC for the power supply. So everywhere you're changing energy from one form to another, and these are all losses. And so, how much is a terawatt hour anyway? Because I've said there are all these terawatt hours, right? So the terawatt hour that you see, San Francisco consumes six terawatt hours per year, and I'm talking about tens and hundreds, right? New York City, 50. Las Vegas, just one st street, okay, Cons <laughs> consumes 33 terawatt hours. And would you know why Las Vegas consumes so much power? Not because of electricity, it's because of air conditioning and blowing air, right, full of oxygen so that you steer up and you keep pulling on those slot machines, right? So they're basically trying to keep you awake they shove oxygenated air, it's all, it's all good, all good fun, but it's a lot of energy, all right? So how much is the terawatt hour? The entire United States, West Coast, consumes 331 terawatt hours. So the amount you can save in energy is equal to the total energy consumed by the Western United States. It's an enormous problem that needs to be solved. Carbon dioxide emissions associated with this, 263 million metric tons per year of carbon dioxide, and in, from uh, the US and in India, 723 million metric tons. This is carbon dioxide, but it's also a health hazard. There is a global warming hazard, there's a health hazard. 
If you go to Delhi, if you can breathe, you're a superman or a superwoman, okay? <laughs> because humans should not be breathing that stuff. But you have to. Until we switch and save the uh, air by going to electric vehicles, that's, that's the problem that the country is going to face. So if we do over the next 100 years, look at the long term, you can save basically 20 gigatons of carbon dioxide just by addressing this conversion problem. 20 gigatons of carbon dioxide and 50% of all conversion losses will be addressed. Okay. Now, market likes eliminating waste, and this is important because if the market is not pushing you, you're not going to prove, you're, uh, things are not going to go forward. So you need the, the, the alliance of science and technology and the markets for a solution to occur. And, and the markets like what, like to save energy. It, and it's an important statement. Now, but the key to mass adoption is a low cost, as opposed to the blue LED. The beautiful thing about the blue LED is when uh, Shuji Nakamura, Amano Sensei, and Akasaki Sensei made this LED, it actually filled a void. There was no blue LED, so it filled a void. And so price was not as important. But when you're talking about gallium nitride, we're replacing silicon. Price is going to be important. So the thing is that, so how do you make things cheaper? Recognize that big stuff costs more, okay? And you have to make things smaller. If you want to reduce the price, make things smaller. And electronic stuff is made out of transistors. They are small and expensive, but just use fewer of them. There are passive elements like capacitors, inductors. These store energy. They're large. They decrease with frequency, so you increase frequency to make them smaller. Heat sinks and enclosures, they are huge. Your, the old stereo amplifiers, you couldn't lift them because not because the transistor was heavy, it's the aluminum heat sink that's heavy. And why do you have an aluminum heat sink? Because you're so lossy, right? So basically create less heat by using higher efficiency devices at higher frequencies. This is the mantra I'd like to leave you with, all right? So you look at this, this is an old C-band, uh, receiver, okay? Y'all might not know this. The, I always said this was too big for normal homes and too ugly for expensive homes, all right? <laughs> so it never went anywhere. But if you look at, uh, you, when we took the, uh, the frequency up from four gigahertz to 18 gigahertz, then you got into this domain of satellite dishes, okay? And they were small and now they're hanging out every window. So, and why did we, why was this? Go to higher frequency, make things smaller, they actually became cheaper and better, all right? So big stuff is bad stuff, okay? You just, okay. And the way we do this is by following what's called the Moore's Law of Power Electronics. And this basically means how much power can I, con can I convert per centimeter cube? And this is make things smaller, the density goes up, so going up on the y-axis here is a good thing. And you see gallium nitride, is the best semiconductor, silicon, silicon carbide, gallium nitride, that's the way things are going. So I'll give you quick examples. Here's a gallium, I don't, I don't expect anybody to, to look at this seriously, but all I want to say is, here's how we make trans a, a typical conversion from AC to DC today. You have a few diodes, a transistor, a diode, and so on and so forth. But instead of doing it like this, what we do is we go to gallium nitride, and we basically have two transistors, no diodes, and two very cheap uh, silicon transistors. These operate at 50 hertz. These operate at 100 kilohertz. You get the same kind of an output, but the efficiency goes from 98% to 99%. So you say, what's the, I spent, I'll spend 20 minutes listening to this guy, and what is now, finally, you're going from 98 to 99%. I mean, you know, I could have had a cup of coffee, it would have been more useful. But please look at this as a saving of 50% of the loss. 98% to 99%, you have cut the loss by 50%. So it's not, impo it's not important to look at efficiency, look at inefficiency. And 50% loss in the reduction of inefficiency. So is this all bull or is it really in the market? It's in the market. So this is a 
gaming power supply, gaming power supplies and Bitcoin and all these things are demanding very high amounts of power and high efficiency. You see this, you can buy this on Amazon or wherever you go to buy the stuff. Um, this is a Corsair power supply. It's smaller than the silicon version, okay? So this is a 1600 watt power supply. It puts more power than a silicon version, smaller, same price. And this has got gallium nitride in it, and that has silicon in it. Why? Because I got rid of this other stuff, made it smaller, it becomes cheaper, higher efficiency. Smaller is better, okay? Size matters, but not in the way one normally thinks. So here, ex ex expanding adoption in adapters and fast charging. If you look at this, right, these, you, you bought all the stuff, okay? You bought new adapters, which are tiny, for your iPhones and other phones that you have. These have gallium nitride inside. Why? You can operate that at high frequencies compared to silicon, and they're highly efficient. Okay, they're already in the market. And now, of course, the return of the electric vehicles. In the 1800s, we had electric vehicles. But now, I'm sorry, I should have had a Volvo here. But <laughs> this is, uh, we have an electric vehicle, right? But the reason we went to electric cars is basically because of better batteries, better motors, power electronics, and software. It's a, it's a confluence of things. If we didn't have software, we wouldn't have an electric car. If we didn't have better batteries, we wouldn't have an electric car. But without power electronics, also we wouldn't have an electric car. So it's a beautiful thing. It's kind of a confluence of things. It's almost as if you, the universe has worked to save the planet, okay? <laughs> and I think, I mean, it's, and there are every, it's in every part of the automobile. In the, in the power supply, there is, uh, there is the power train, which drives the car. Silicon car carbide penetration has started. Gallium nitride is in the future. And I won't spend too much time on this because of lack of time. But let me give you a little pictorial so that, you know, inside of a, how much do I have? Okay. Inside a hybrid vehicle, and this is just a schematic, so that to give you an impression. So if you take an, and this is a Prius, just, uh, and if you look at, you you have an internal combustion engine in the Prius, and then you basically have a power conversion unit. This is what drives the electric motors, and this is what drives the and this is the engine in a hybrid car. But you have two you have two uh, radiators, one to cool the internal combustion en engine, and the other to cool the power electronics, because one radiator runs hot and the other runs cold. So basically what ends up happening is that if you end up having, so this active cooling for electronics is something that is just there to cool the electronics. But if I took an electronics and I made them extremely efficient and eliminated water cooling, then basically what ends up happening is that the second radiator that I had that will disappear, right? And why? Because I don't have to cool this, these electronics anymore. There used to be a radiator to cool it. I made it very efficient. I get rid of the radiator. And getting rid of a, a radiator in a car, can you imagine? That's money. To get space in, not only did you get rid of the radiator, now you have got space to put more stuff to make the car more expensive and make more money. Okay, so just kidding. Okay. This also goes into... Uh, Scooters and three-wheelers It started with cars, but it's it's going backwards into other forms of mobility That was 650 volt scan Gallium nitride can also do 1200 volts. Okay, so here is an example 12 because the battery in a car right now is 400 volts The battery is going to move to 800 volts if that moves to 800 volts you need a, a Transistor that can operate at 1200 volts. So what has happened now is that we have just demonstrated, just announced, a 1200 volt gallium nitride prototype versus state of the art silicon carbide. This is on sil sapphire. This material, this gallium nitride is grown on sapphire. Thanks to these, the screen, this screen is also made of gallium nitride on sapphire. The price of sapphire has now dropped in a, in a decade from almost few hundred dollars, five hundred dollars for a wafer, to now five minutes. Okay, to uh, about $50 a wafer. So it is just amazing. So this is a possibility going forward. I have five minutes left, so let me just go to RF. We are in a whole new domain of millimeter waves. 
What, what do I mean by that? We used to be at 4G, now we are at 5G, and we're gonna to go to 6G. 6G is hyper-connectivity. And this is basically going to very high frequencies, 95 gigahertz and above. Right now, we are at a few 2.5 gigahertz to five. Now we're gonna to go to about 30 gigahertz. Communications is gonna happen at very high frequency because we want a lot of bandwidth. To do that, we need transistors which have very high gain, high power, and low leakage. So let me tell you what that means. If I can get a lot of power, which is efficient, the size of the base station will drop. This is very imp important. Why? Because base stations are not going to be one every 10 kilometers. There's going to be a base station communicating with you every 100 meters, every 200 meters. So it's almost you're going to be surrounded by base stations everywhere, small base stations, very cheap, on every light pole. So with giving you a lot of data. So to do that, you've got to, again, become cheap, highly efficient. So what we've done now is I'll give you, a, and I'll try to finish in the next couple of minutes. Gallium nitride has been magnificent. Uh, we started work in 1996. And output power is the same as, say, light output from an LED. More is better. And you just see that in 1996, we started with low power, less, less than one watt per millimeter. And by several innovations, we went to 40 watts per millimeter, a factor of 40 in the improvement in the amount of power, four zero. This is very difficult to do in electronics. Doubling some efficiency is hard enough. Make going up by factors of 40 is amazing. But since you could do that, all of a sudden, we opened the whole commercial market. It was only a defense market before. But once it became cheap, it became a commercial market, and now the commercial market is dwarfing the defense market and is over a billion dollars in next year. And it went, and its technology is all about high efficiency. Now, when you go to millimeter wave applications, 79 gigahertz in the automotive radar, so if you look at 94 gigahertz, which is what I'll work on now, I'll talk to now. At 94 gigahertz, the output power is very small. I told you it was 40 watts per millimeter. This is only three watts per millimeter. Because when you go to higher frequencies, it gets very difficult to make these devices produce power with efficiency. And we can talk at, over coffee over that. But let me just tell you that if you use normal gallium nitride, which is already great, if you try to make something at 95 gigahertz, this is how it looks. It needs a bloody crane to lift the thing up, okay? And this is, it's a tour the force is good for the military, terrible for commercial applications, okay? So what we did is we completely switched the gallium nitride from gallium polar to nitrogen polar. We just turned the crystal on its head and what it did was give us completely new physics totally new physics based on the polarization, the, the, the sense of the polarization. So the electrons ended up literally on top instead of below aluminum gallium nitride. And just that little thing changed the whole world. Okay, so we then developed this very fancy thing. I won't describe it. But what it did was it basically solved a bunch of problems, including uh, very low resistance, high gain, and got the transistor to operate in a way where in the past we had power that was stuck here in gallium, in normal what is called gallium polar GAN in the few watts per millimeter. Mm -hmm. And when we went to nitrogen polar, we got nine watts per millimeter, mm -hmm. a factor of three. So think about it. Just took a crystal and flipped it. And then you did the technology. So I'll finish with this slide. So, you know, this is kind of tongue in cheek, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it depends on your point of view, right? What I've tried to tell you is gallium nitride is great. But if you're from Texas, that's what the map of America looks like, right? <laughs> so take everything I said, you know, with a pinch of salt, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what, this is what Ye Yol says, gallium nitride is sitting somewhere here and there's sharing stuff with silicon carbide and silicon and so on and so forth. And in my point of view, that's the world of GAN, okay? But that's my point of view. But I believe that because it has an ecosystem, 
uh, I believe that it's going to be uh, it's going to be a GAN world going forward. And I'd like to finish with the slide, which says, because of its vast number of applications on which we can stand, we can actually produce a better performance at lower cost, but it needs a lot of science and it needs a lot of technology. And so, but the end result is very high performance at low cost. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, uh, welcome back. Um, eight years ago, uh, the academy, and especially my colleagues and myself in the physics class awarded the 2014 Nobel Prize in Physics to the three Japanese scientists, Akazaki, Amano, and Nakamura. And the phrasing was for the invention of the blue LED, enabling bright and energy saving white light source. And that has had a big impact and has affected all of us in getting much more efficient, cheaper light, and also the ability to provide safe light in many areas also at nighttime, and also incorporating new kind of lighting technology in building architectural lighting. But it's much more than lighting. What you see here is another example of LEDs. This is ultra small LEDs. So each of these, I can see it if I stand really close, uh, it's a little pixel of uh, a blue and a green and a red um, minimal size LED. And that together provides this very, very bright uh, uh, display. But uh, what we primarily talk today is about the importance of not only white light, but actually what, what light and illumination and light exposure does in terms of physiological, neurological, psychological, in general, well-being and well-functioning to us people. And to cover this area and probably much more, we have one of the real experts with us today, Professor Anja Holbert from Newcastle. Uh, let me briefly say that she ha had a background, actually safe to know that she started out as a physicist, <laughs> both in, in, in physics and, and also in, in theoretical physics. But then going into uh, uh, physiology uh, in uh, Cambridge, and then got a PhD in brain and cognitive sciences uh, uh, at MIT, and then a medical doctor at Harvard Medical School, and then later returning to the UK to Oxford and now in, in Newcastle. Uh, Anna Herbert is a professor of visual neuroscience, director of a center for translational systems neuroscience with Welcome Trust Funding, and she's the Dean of Advancement of, at, at the University of Newcastle. Her research involves study and interaction between color and light and how these are interpreted by the human brain. We will learn much more by listening to her talk called Human-Centric LED Lighting. Please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lars. It's a little bit daunting to be here, especially amongst so many distinguished uh, physicists. Um, I, following um, the wonderful talk by Professor Mishra, I'm going to dive down into just the, the brief mention he made of photonics and uh, talk about light. Um, we um, humans uh, relish light and our physiology is governed by light. Over the millennia, we have uh, evolved our visual and non-visual systems in response to natural light, both moonlight and uh, sunlight. And when we learned how to make uh, fire, perhaps a million years ago, uh, we first began to use artificial light. And uh, you see the distant fire of the, um, of the, sh oh, the shepherds, it's very exciting, um, <laughs> on the hillside here, contrasting with the radiance of the angel in the sky, both of them outshone by the light-emitting infant Christ, the first depiction thereof, and described by Saint Bridget of Sweden in the 14th century as being brighter than the sun. 
So then about 70,000 years ago, of course, we had um, uh, um, candle, uh, we, so firelight about um, a million years ago, um, then torches and oil lamps about 70,000 years ago, and then the candle um, in about 400 BC after the invention of the wick. Gas lights, of course, were used uh, extensively in the 19th century until the late 19th century in the invention of the incandescent light bulb, which has been with us for 120 years, followed by fluorescent lights and then, of course, LEDs, which I'll talk about later. But I do want to just mention one thing about in the incandescent light bulb, because we usually credit its invention to Thomas Edison, but of course it was Sir Joseph Swan who independently invented the incandescent light bulb. And I want to mention him because he comes from the part of the world where I now live. And he in fact demonstrated um, the first public room demonstration of the incandescent light bulb in, um, the, um, in the Lit and Phil um, in Newcastle, a building which still exists, established in 1739, and the first um, total illumination of a public building in the world by electricity was in the Savoy Theatre, again by Joseph Swan with 1,200 incandescent uh, light bulbs illuminating that theatre. So, of course, most of our, uh, but the incandescent light bulb, as we know, is very energy inefficient. Um, only about 5% of the energy that it consumes is converted into light and the rest is lost by heat. Um, but um, most of, well, almost half of the energy consumption that we take up is due to electricity and about 15% of electricity usage is due to lighting. And the prediction made in about 2016 by the Department of Energy was that we could have a 75% energy savings um, in our energy use for lighting through the use of solid state lighting. So the advent of solid state lighting has enabled vast improvements in um, energy savings, which is best for the health of the planet. But concomitant with that, we have the prospect of creating better health for people by optimizing these, the solid state lighting to improve human, not just human vision, but uh, mood, well-being, performance, productivity, and health, as well as treatment of ill health. And that leads us to human-centric lighting. So solid-state lighting has made human-centric lighting possible. But what do we mean by human-centric lighting? Of course, lighting is there to enable humans to see. It's been developed so that we can have better vision, visual comfort, visibility. But what we've learned in the last, say, 20 years as much about the effects of lighting on the non-visual aspects of our physiology. And so human-centric lighting is all about designing lighting to optimize um, the effects of lighting on that myriad of non-visual functions. So just to uh, dive a little bit more into that topic, um, I'm going to cover these, um, these areas, uh, human response to light, what are the characteristics of natural daylight under which we evolved? And I'm going to talk a little bit about just a couple of case studies just to sort of illustrate the gap between the massive research advantages that are happening, advances that are happening in solid state lighting and the actual delivery of those advances in, um, in some commercial applications. And I'll briefly mention some future directions. So the human response to light is dual. There are two main pathways that emanate from the retina at the back of the eye. The pathway that we talk about the most is the visual pathway, which emanates from the classical retinal ganglion cells, the output cells of the retina, and they're fed by multiple layers, but beginning with light that strikes the light sensors in the eyes, the rods and cones. And through that pathway, which leads to the back of the brain, the occipital lobe, we have conscious vision we see colors, textures, motion, shapes. We perceive um, objects and we can consciously report those objects that we see. And we can measure the, the characteristics of light, the colorimetric properties of light based on um, uh, their, 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 their excitation of the cone photoreceptors. But about 20 years ago, a second class of retinal ganglion cells was discovered, which themselves respond directly to light. These are the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, and they contain a pigment called melanopsin, which confers the ability uh, to respond directly to light. So they're fed by the receptors, the light sensors, 
in the um, outer portion of the retina, but they also uh, respond directly to light. And their projections are widespread through the brain to multiple areas, affecting um, primarily our circadian phase, so the entrainment of the body's functions to the light-dark cycle, but as well the pupillary light reflex, how, uh, how open the pupil is in response to light, and hormone release, in particular melatonin release, but many other functions as well, including muscle strength, cardiovascular function, which also vary with the time of day. Now, melanopsin, the pigment contained in these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, has a spectral sensitivity uh, which peaks in the short wavelength region around 480 nanometers. And you can see from this diagram here that um, the spectral sensitivity of melanopsin here in the magenta uh, curve overlaps with the spectral sensitivity of the short wavelength or blue cone, the green cone, and the red cone. So um, the uh, effects of stimulating melanopsin are difficult to disentangle from the effects of stimulating the cones and the rods and the effects on vision. But we characterize the activation of this non-visual pathway through it, melanopic lux, which is the power seen by that melanopsin uh, um, pigment. And you see here um, melanopic lux um, being uh, represented by this spectral band around 480, which is different from photopic lux, which is the visual brightness of light that we, that we perceive. So these uh, two systems interact at multiple levels, not just in the overlapping of the um, spectral sensitivities of the pigments. But um, the challenge is to isolate the separate effects in these two pathways. And uh, I want to get into how it is that solid state lighting has enabled us to dis disentangle those two effects. But first I want to talk about a little bit more about the spectral and temporal characteristics of natural daylight. So natural daylight is a mixture of directional sunlight and diffuse um, skylight, which uh, create um, a set of characteristic daylight spectra, which vary throughout the day, which vary with um, geographical location and with season as well. And here you see a group of spectra um, measured in Newcastle in October 2021 varying from high short wavelength content, content to low short wavelength um, content. And the uh, diffuse and directional components are separated out um, here as well. Now, these, uh, this, because of the fact that daylight is a mixture of these two different uh, sources, um, the chromaticities, or colors as you would call them, vary in a systematic way along what we call the daylight locus. Here, here plotted in the CIE chromaticity diagram. The daylight locus closely follows the Planckian locus, but that's not because of actual temperature uh, variation. It's, um, it's almost accidental. But the chromaticities then of daylight vary from uh, bluish to orangish, orangish along this line, with most of the uh, deeper chromaticities uh, falling in the blue end of the spectrum. Now, this uh, variation from bluish to oranges is deeply embedded in our psyche. And you can argue that Turner actually captured this in his paintings. His color beginning, um, shown here, um, when you take the chromaticities from this artwork and plot them in chromaticity diagram, you see they fall almost perfectly along the daylight locus. Uh, now, what... Um, Spectrally tunable illumination has allowed us to do is to um, isolate the effects of, on the non-visual pathway and the visual pathway while creating spectra that mimic natural daylight. And uh, in my lab, we've been using spectrally tunable lights um, created from um, multi-package LED systems for about 10 years. Um, this being well, the first prototype we used with 10 um, LED primaries, eight pure color, and uh, two um, white LEDs. And we've used these to measure um, a variety of um, visual and non-visual functions. Here um, I show a sample daylight spectrum, 
uh, the red and the blue lines created by our algorithm, which can optimize the light spectra to match a particular spectra in terms of its um, power distribution or in terms of its colorimetric properties as seen by the human visual system. And um, in some of the experiments we've done in the lab, we've looked at the, um, uh, the difference between um, melanopic lux and photopic lux in terms of its effects on uh, visual comfort, mood, sleepiness, um, and attention. Here, for example, um, I show the results of an experiment carried out in a light room illuminated by these uh, multi-channel LED lights um, using several different spectra, which either had the same melanopic lux but differing photopic lux, so differing brightness, or vice versa. People came into the light room, sat there um, for uh, five hours at night, and were exposed um, after a period of exposure to dim light, uh, they were exposed to the experimental light stimulus. And the uh, results here are plotted um, as the change in melatonin release, which we measured every half an hour in the individuals. And the key point here is that melatonin release, melatonin being the sleepiness hormone, uh, was uh, determined only by the melanopic lux of the light, not by the brightness. So a bright white light had the same suppression of melatonin power as a dim blue light when they had the same melanopic lux. Whereas a bright amber light here did not suppress melatonin um, at all. Um, it's um, the suppression of melatonin, the, the lack of suppression of melatonin here is not significantly different from the lack of melatonin suppression by this very dim red light. Also, people felt much more comfortable in the amber light, the bright amber light at night. And they really, really did not like the uh, dim blue light or the bright white light because um, they felt that uh, they um, interfered with their mood. Although sleepiness was decreased, which you see in this graph here, sleepiness uh, going down in the hours when the light stimulus was delivered between sort of 10 and midnight, um, being made more alert at that time of night was actually quite uncomfortable. And people really loved the, uh, the amber light, so it increased their uh, mood. Performance on some visual attention tasks was also improved under this, under this light. So melanopic lux um, has a very strong effect on key indicators of um, the human circadian system. Now, but those experiments were done with static light delivered for over a period of four hours in, in the light room. What about the dynamism of daylight? And what would happen if we mimicked the, the temporal changes of, of daylight? Uh, what would be the effect on the non-visual and visual pathways? Well, let's look more closely at the temporal dynamics of natural illumination, which are governed largely by the change in solar elevation. So the um, pattern of illuminance, uh, pattern of illuminance over the course of the day, um, follows very closely the solar elevation angle um, in a near in a smooth parabolic shape over the course of the day. But you can see that in certain parts of the world, and particularly Northeast England, where Ruben Pastilla made these measurements on top of a hilltop, that smooth parabolic um, variation in illuminance is interrupted by cloud movements um, and wind, so it becomes a much more uh, jagged temporal profile. Um, and this little video doesn't work, but it shows that uh, the changes in illuminance over the course of the day can be very, very rapid because of wind movement uh, and cloud uh, movement correspondingly. Now, this pattern exists across the world in different geographic locations with this uh, parabolic change in illuminance over the course of the day interrupted by jagged spikes due to uh, local weather conditions. But the other thing I want you to notice here is that the chromaticity changes um, in um, the course of the day are very rapid at dawn and at dusk, but largely um, slow and stable in the middle part of the day. So the chromaticity of light doesn't change that much during the course of the day. It changes very rapidly at dawn and dusk. 
Key point being that at dawn, you have decreasing blueness in the light and increasing brightness. And at dusk, you have increasing blueness and decreasing brightness. Um, and the main difference between uh, seasons, of course, is not the shape of the change in the luminance, but the uh, number of hours of daylight that are experienced, say the peak of the curve. And of course, you know that in Sweden, this uh, difference is much, much, much more dramatic. But the fastest changes in color occur at sunset and sunrise. So we ask the question, is the visual system optimized to see these changes in chromaticity of light? And again, spectrally tunable illumination in our light room has enabled us to um, examine both the visual response as well as the non-visual response. Uh, to changes in uh, light that mimic the changes in natural daylight. And in this um, setup, um, people sit in a white room and the light slowly changes and they simply have to indicate when they see it changing or not. But a proper psychophysics paradigm is followed so that we can find the exact threshold, the subjective threshold for detecting these changes in light. And just to cut a long story short, we find that the ability to see to visually detect smooth, slow changes in the chromaticity of light, such as would happen um, at uh, dawn or dusk, very much depends on the starting point of the, um, of the light. So for lights that are very cool, so very bluish lights, it's much more difficult to see changes in the warm direction that take the light back to a neutral level. And for warm lights, uh, that starting at a very a warm color temperature, a yellowish color temperature, um, it's much more difficult uh, to see changes in the cooler direction, which take the light chromaticity back towards neutral. The higher threshold means a lower sensitivity. So overall, it's more difficult to see changes towards neutral than away from neutral. And this suggests that the human visual system has embedded in it an a priori assumption that light is neutral. Um, then there's a Bayesian probability model um, elaborating that a bit more. Similarly, for uh, lights that change in both chromaticity and in illuminance, we again find this difference uh, between um, the sensitivity to changes in uh, directions either towards or away from neutral. Here, uh, for, um, starting from a cool temperature, again, it's much harder to see changes in the warm direction, which take the light back to neutral, it's much easier to see changes that make the light more cooler still. And that's for uh, light that changes in both chromaticity and in lux. Overall, what these results suggest is that we're more sensitive to the bluing of illumination at dusk, uh, when the light is already blue, than the yellowing at dawn. So in the morning, when light is both increasing in lux and becoming more yellow, we're less sensitive to, see it, to that change. We don't see that change as well. But the caveat here is that all of these changes that we've uh, devised in the lab, they're all much faster than actual changes in daylight um, in, in, in the real world. So the changes that are happening out there are too slow for the visual brain to see directly. So what, why is that? And we hypothesize that, that the uh, visual cortex has developed mechanisms that enable us to uh, be insensitive to those changes in illumination, chromaticity, and lux in order to give us color constancy, which is actually the um, topic on which I've spent much of my um, research life. Why do we see objects as remaining stable in color? We have mechanisms designed to uh, basically filter out these temporal changes in illumination that occur in the natural world. But then why is it that we have a sense that illumination can change? When you go outside, you think, oh, the illumination has actually changed. Or I see now it's evening, the light's getting much bluer. Where do we get that sense of change in the illumination? And here we see what the effects um, look like on a scene. Um, the light changes very dramatically in chromaticity from a bluish light 
to a yellowish light, and you can see that the object, the light reflected from the object is actually changing hugely under those two conditions, but we're largely insensitive to that because we have color constancy, because we've evolved these visual cortical mechanisms to dampen our sensitivity to those changes. But the second part of our hypothesis is that it's actually the non-visual system that follows the temporal changes in illumination because it's a much more sluggish system and we argue that it's the primordial light detector. It's what we actually had earliest in evolution and it's, it's that non-visual pathway that is following the slow temporal changes in illumination. The melanopsin cells are actually at the front of the retina closest to where the light enters. The receptors are at the back of the retina, which is, seems bizarre, but now makes sense when you think of it this way. And these melanopsin cells are actually designed to um, follow and to register these slow changes in um, daylight to regulate our circadian rhythms. And at the same time, because those projections are very widespread through the brain, they give us a sort of subconscious sense of the illumination changing without a conscious perception thereof. So that's the sort of theory um, that we're, we're developing about the interaction between the visual and non-visual systems. But let's now um, just have a look at uh, briefly about the situation um, of lighting as it exists now in our workplaces and our, and our homes and our hospitals and our clinical um, settings. So artificial illumination is not, does not behave like natural daylight for the most part, limited chromaticity range, static, very poor color quality, and um, even um, with tunable LEDs, tunable white LEDs and pure color LEDs, um, there's not a very good match to the broadband spectrum of daylight. And we don't like static light and we don't like windowless office people who are not as productive and they're not as happy uh, outside of daylight. So how can we mimic daylight and put it into um, our settings? This is just a sample diet of light sources measured in the northeast of UK and you can see from the shape of those spectra that there's still a lot of fluorescent light around. There's still some incandescent uh, lights around in, um, in indoor domestic settings, but there's still a lot of fluorescent uh, tubes as well as some tunable white lights. So the well-being, uh, well-building regulations uh, have a lot about light in them uh, that we should need to um, uh, optimize light in these settings in order to create um, optimal conditions for um, health and well-being. And in particular, uh, there are now guidelines that stipulate a certain level of melanopic lux as well as photopic lux, which must be delivered by lighting systems. And also, they stipulate a certain level of color quality, which can only really be achieved with very broadband um, illuminations. But these regulations don't talk about the timing of the melanopic lux delivery, and that's key, because we note that while uh, blue light in the morning might be quite good in its alerting uh, power, it's really not nice in the evening, as we found in the lab and other settings. So the timing of delivery of this melanopic lux is key, which means that ultimately what we need are smart building systems in which individual um, uh, um, light reception can be monitored as well as individual physiology and psychology, and then the light spectrum throughout the building can be optimized in such a way to improve health and well-being. And a number of studies have shown that optimizing the um, light delivery, and in particular the dynamics of light during the day, can improve circadian physiology, sleep quality, visual comfort, and cognitive performance. In one uh, case study, which I'll just very briefly talk about, um, Alish Lenis and um, a team at Arup showed that uh, dynamic lighting can improve um, visual clarity um, and mood and visual preference. Um, another um, case study that I just wanted to mention because it's just come out is very exciting, showed that upgrading the lighting to a dynamic lighting system in care homes in the Midwest in the States reduced falls in the elderly by 43%. Um, this is from Stephen Lockley's group. And in an ongoing study that uh, we're hoping to carry out with Circadia Care, 
we're going to be looking at mood and sleep quality in a care home. So just very briefly, do I have do I have five minutes still? I think I do. Yes. Yep. So just I just want to mention this case study that um, Alice Linus and the team carried out um, at Arup London to actually first of all determine could we um, install dynamic lighting without disrupting normal work in the workplace? And I think that video is supposed to play Nicholas in the left-hand corner. Doesn't seem to be playing. Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so just just showing the change in in light over the day. So um, a, a several pre-programmed sequences of light were set up, each delivered for a period of two weeks over a course of a nine-week study. Um, and we also used a sequence of lights which matched daylight in real time via a spectrometer on the roof that recorded the light and then delivered it through the tunable um, light sources. And the light sources were um, the Vega 07 from LED motif, which was simply a seven channel, seven pure channel tunable um, LED system shown here. These are the seven different colors. And the um, spectra of lights that could be matched with this pure spectrally tunable system are shown here, matching a sort of tungsten uh, light here, matching daylight here, um, and this is uh, matching exactly a melanopic um, stimulus here. Now, to, to set up this study, the first thing that had to be done was to block out the daylight that was already coming into this space. And the worry was this was going to really upset the uh, inhabitants who were having to work throughout this nine week period. So the windows were blocked off here and um, the fluorescent panels which were in the ceiling were removed and the diffuse Vega 7 downlighters were installed. And this is what the room looked like under each of the seven um, channels um, shown independently. Um, uh, the participants in the study, who were the normal workers in this era office in London, were then set up with lots of wearables to measure various <clears throat> physiological indicators, and they were asked to perform visual attention tasks at different times during the day, and to answer questionnaires at several times during the day as well, evaluating their subjective sleep uh, quality, uh, their mood, and their mental effort. And we also correlated those results with objective um, sleep diaries, and they had to perform little attention tests on their computers at different times of day. So just um, briefly, the uh, dynamic light sequences that we used, were, there were two main types of sequences, one in which both photopic and melanopic lux changed together through the course of the day, from high levels in the morning to low levels in the evening. This is a, a close simulation of daylight, okay? Uh, and in a second sequence, we kept photopic lux um, at a constant level and the chromaticity of the light um, at a constant level, but changed the melanopic lux only. In this final sequence, we used um, a spectrometer on the roof to record the actual daylight spectra outside and then to deliver these via the Internet of Things to the light hub um, that controlled the, um, the light emitted from the tunable light systems. And the uh, spectral match to daylight outside was pretty good, as you see here, by comparing the blue and the black curves. So just really, really briefly, just a few of the subjective results. There's a, a, a large number of results here. Just to say that the most preferred sequences based on a number of um, uh, results were the sequence A that mimicked daylight and daylight itself. These were considered to be the most pleasant lights, the most uh, liked lights. The um, sequence B was the least preferred, so the light that changed only in melanopic lux but not in the other parameters was the least liked. And the daylight, both simulated and um, the sequence A, um, were um, also best for visual clarity and lightness. So this is sort of expected, but it was useful to get quantitative results that demonstrated this in a very clear way. But one key point I want to make here is that there's a vast 
diversity in individual responses. So we collected a lot of data from each individual, and we found that there were some morning people and some evening people. And you see here um, that, for example, this, um, this uh, person here is a morning person. The blue line shows the, um, uh, can't see myself, the, um, the uh, effort, the alertness that, um, sorry. <laughs> Uh, okay, this, this person feels more alert in the morning and less alert. Yes, so the blue line is morning and the green line is afternoon. Mm -hmm. So under every light condition, this person is more alert in the morning and less alert in the afternoon and feels they're making better effort in the morning than in the afternoon. But the overall effects, the uh, preference for the daylight are, um, are still upheld in this individual. Contrast this with this evening person who feels much, much, uh, has much better attention in the, um, in the afternoon than in the morning, and his response times are much slower, longer in the morning than in the afternoon. Now, so people d differ hugely, and therefore their responses to changes in the light might be very different as well. So neurodiversity must be taken into account and we must consider how to deliver personalized lighting in order to achieve the best impact for all individuals. Now, the last case study I just briefly want to mention is one um, that's ongoing right now at St. Catherine's, a dementia specialist home in Shipton, New York, run by the Welburn Care Homes, uh, with a lighting installation made by Circada Care Company, a company that um, I've recently started work with. And they did a complete refit of this care home, uh, installing spectrally tunable lights across the entire building. And here you see a comparison, and it's literally from um, dark to light of the previous uh, lighting in the care home to the current lighting here. With the um, <clears throat> interior design also carefully considered, so the look of the luminaires very carefully considered, and the coloring of the walls also very carefully considered because, of course, the light that comes into the eye depends not only on the light shining on the objects, but on the reflectance properties of those surfaces. So all of this is considered in order to maximize and to, uh, the accuracy of the spectral light reaching the eyes. And as I said, the installation is throughout the building, including very beautiful chandeliers in the dining room, which are completely spectrally tunable LED systems. And the uh, sequence is pre-programmed and delivered throughout the uh, building um, to, again, maximize the delivery of um, high melanopic lux in the morning and minimize it in the evening. So the, uh, you do see color changes in the light through the course of the day. Um, and the reports thus far are that the residents are much more engaged, um, they don't fall asleep at lunch, and they have better sleep quality at night. But we hope to uh, make objective measurements um, to um, determine the actual impact of these lighting changes in this care home. And just a brief comment about energy savings, because we are here to talk about energy efficiency. Now, in the office study that I mentioned at Arup, in fact, uh, using spectrally tunable lights um, uh, reduced lumen efficiency when we put on cooler lights on. However, if we had used tunable white lights, we could have had a theoretical improvement in energy efficacy going from warm to cool um, CCTs. And in this uh, new five-channel system used in the circadian care system, uh, we do get the, that um, energy efficiency by combining um, tunable whites with pure color LEDs in a five-channel system. And the average lumen per watt um, over the course of the day is 72 or 65 when you include losses. And we I know that it's very important to think about losses. And this um, is a comparable energy efficiency to a fixed spectrum LED light at 4,000 K, a relatively warm. Uh, temperature, but the circadian stimulus is optimized to be four times higher at the key points in the day. So we can get energy efficiency as well as improved health and well-being and mood in the elderly with dementia. So just to recap the various things that I feel 
are important to consider with dynamic circadian lighting for the workplace. We need to design spectra for optimal power consumption, and that means taking advantage of advances in LED uh, technology. And install infrastructure to record and replay daylight. You can use local daylight so you can get what's outside here, but maybe you don't want that in winter. Maybe you want the light from Granada, Spain in winter delivered here <laughs> in Sweden. We certainly do in Northeast England. And the advances in nanomaterials research will be very important to enable us to better tailor these spectrally tunable systems to the human visual and non-visual systems. And this means filling the green gap, which I didn't talk about, and what I call narrowing the red spread, spread at the end. This will increase energy efficiency, but it will also enable us to tailor the lights better to the, responsive, uh, to the responses of our two uh, pathways. Personalized light regimes will be key, and we need smarter systems control. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we now come to the third um, presenter today. So this is uh, Lars Stenqvist, who is uh, Executive Vice President of Volvo Group, Trax Technology, the CTO of the Volvo Group. And he'll talk about something that is being discussed very, very much these days in, in media, uh, namely the need to go away from combustion engines and switch to electrical transport. I heard yesterday that I think California will ban any combustion engines, petrol or, or diesel from, or is it 2030 or 35, 25. in that range? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Past goals. And um, I can mention I spend quite a lot of time these days in Shenzhen, the high-tech city in so southern China. And there, when I was there, I came there a year ago, I noticed that all public transportation is only electrical buses, only electrical taxis are available or allowed, and all two-wheel vehicles are electrical. There is not a single you know, combustion engine. And I'm sure that, that's a trend. It's, it happened maybe earlier there and in California and many other places, but I think it's going to come here as well. So with that, uh, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Lars Stinkvist. Uh, he has a background of Master of Sciences in Industrial Engineering from Chalmers University of Technology. He's a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences, IVA. And he will then talk to us about the super hot topic of electrical vehicles, obviously geared heavily towards uh, the heavy transportation. So the title uh, is Electrification of Transport. We very much look forward to your talk. So I've been asked to talk about electrification of transport then, but I think I need to start with a few words uh, about the Volvo Group. So Volvo Group then trucks, construction equipment, buses and powertrain solutions. I dare to say it's everything but cars. Hmm. Already in 1999 we divested our passenger car division and in that time to Ford and that is today the very successful company Volvo Cars listed on Stockholm uh, Exchange. We are very happy for their success uh, because we share the brand and it would be a catastrophe of course if one of the two companies didn't really perform in the right level. So it's uh, trucks, construction equipment, uh, buses and powertrain solutions. Size-wise then, uh, these are the figures for the first six months this year but if we extrapolate them to full year, size-wise 400 billion sec top line, 40 billion dollars. Uh, approximately 100,000 employees. We are active in 190 markets if you want to buy our vehicles out there. I can say easily it's not North Korea and a few others but for the rest you can buy them. Gross R&D uh, approximately on 2 billion euros, 20 billion sec. Half of it in Sweden, half of it outside Sweden. If you compare that to the top line, the sales in Sweden is just 2%, but we have 50, 50% of the R&D in Sweden. For one simple reason, Sweden is a good country for R&D. Our 13,000 engineers globally are engaged in a huge challenge. The biggest transformation of our industry ever, and I'm of course talking about taking it to fossil free. 
We have been relying on combustion engines and fossil fuel for 100 years. And now in a few decades, we are going to turn it upside down, fossil free. My presentation today is about transport in general. And I will start with the easy part, the no brainer. Passenger cars will be mainly battery electric. Yeah, it's very clear there will be some top line vehicles that will use fuel cells, but the absolute majority will be battery electric. And we see that it's picking up rather quick already now. For other sectors in transport, it's more difficult. There is not one silver bullet when it comes to technology. If there was a silver bullet to my industry, life would have been so much easier for me as chief technology officer and for all my engineer, but in engineers. But it's good for the engineers that life is not easy because there is so much more to explore and we will need a lot of technologies in parallel. We will need a lot of innovation in many technologies uh, in order to decarbonize all kinds of transport. Let me share our thinking with you, how we view the future in our industry. Of course, starting to the very right, we support the Paris Agreement and the European Green Deal, talking about net zero by 2050. So if we move into 2050, if we go out here on the highway outside Stockholm, all vehicles rolling out there should be fossil free, 2050. 2050 is then, how do we do this? Yeah, over here, running fleet, decarbonized. But if the vehicles have a life length of approximately 10 years, then of course, 2050 turns to 2040. All vehicles we will sell from 2040 and onwards must be fossil free. That is the promise, that is the title of the slide. It means that less than two decades from now, we're gonna turn it from approximately 0% to 100% fossil free. We could have relied on the combustion engine also in the long run, but then running on renewable fossil free fuel. Our analysis shows that there will not be enough biofuel in order to completely decarbonize road transport and infrastructure solutions. There will definitely be biofuels available, but they will be used in other industries, in other sectors, and a small part to us as well, but we cannot rely on combustion engines for the majority. The majority of the vehicles, as indicated in this slide, will be electric. Absolute majority of the vehicles. A com combination of battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles. Battery electric vehicles have their sweet spot starting in city distribution, refuse collection, a little bit shorter range where you, in many cases, come home in the evening Rather simple case when it comes to charging infrastructure. Fuel cell electric vehicles with more energy on board has their sweet spot more on the really long range. If you need to refuel them, you can refuel them in a very quick way. 20 minutes instead of charging for hours. So uh, technologies have their different sweet spots and we believe in... Uh, we believe in high volumes for both these two technologies when it comes to electric vehicles. But there is no really sharp line between these two uh, technologies. It will very, very much depend upon the availability of cheap green electricity and or cheap green hydrogen. And this will vary across the globe. But then it's also important to say, if you look at the lower section towards 2040, 2050, we believe in combustion engines as well. For certain applications, they will be the absolutely best choice than running on expensive biofuel for applications where cost is a second priority. It is essential to point out, and that's what we show here with going a little bit from blue into white, that everything this is of course depending on that we get access to clean energy. And I think that in many cases, this is a bigger challenge to society than the development of our vehicles as such. So what about the rest of the transport industry then? Well, I think that we can see a rather similar pattern for aviation, for shipping, for trucking, left to right, from left, short range, less energy, 
a lot of batteries, a lot of battery electric solutions. If you go to the very right, long, long, long range, intercontinental, you need a lot of energy on board. There you will see more solutions based upon biofuels, combustion engines. And in the middle of this slide, you will see a lot of high hybrid solutions. For example, ships operating electric when they go into port and then switching into another mode for a long range, etc. So rather similar pattern, even though we're working with different kinds of technologies. So where are we then on this journey? How far have we come when it comes to battery electric vehicles? They are there already today. And they are there when it comes to city buses. It's a given. They are there when it comes to uh, compact, mid-sized excavators, wheel loaders, refuse trucks, city distribution vehicles. Um, we are, as a matter of fact, market leaders in both Europe and in North America when it comes to electric trucks. And why is that? Because we have the broad product palette in the group and we started with electric buses. Long before there was a market demand on trucks, we started with buses. But my engineers clearly designed all components, all systems in a modular way. So when the market started to pick up for trucks, it was rather easy to install all those components and systems into the trucks and be the early market uh, leader to be the pioneer. We are creating the market right now in Europe and in North America. We have more than 50% market share of electric trucks in Europe right now. Top left here is something very special. Next week we will start serial production of a heavy duty battery electric truck in uh, Gothenburg. So you can buy a truck up to 44 ton. That's the real heavy ones that you see out here and starting to deliver them in a few weeks to the first customers. Uh, we will have 540 kilowatt hours on board of energy on those vehicles, very depending on your application. If you're driving hilly conditions, if you have light load, or if you use your 44 tons, the range will differ, but um, 300, 400 kilometers, and then you need to charge. For many of our customers, that's sufficient, but not for the really long haul. That will come in some years. When it comes to fuel cells, that's a technology that has been used for passenger cars for a rather long time. Not in really high volumes, but definitely used. But for us in the heavy duty transport industry, we have completely different requirements on the technology compared to the pass car guys. Completely different power levels completely different life length requirements and different requirements on other parameters as well. So there is no off-the-shelf fuel cell technology available today. And we are in the midst of the development of this right now. We have vehicles uh, out there. We are testing both our construction machines with fuel cells as well as our trucks. I was out driving just before vacation. Beautiful feeling this will take in development from the laboratories onto the road. And it's great to work with these kind of products then. We will commercialize fuel cell electric vehicles in the second half of this decade. So towards 2030. And a few words on fuel cells. And I think that you, many of you are aware about this, of course. But it is an electric vehicle. I very often get this question from journalists, uneducated journalists. Do you believe in electric vehicles or fuel cell vehicles? And that's of course the wrong question then. It's an electric vehicle. For us, it's the identical driveline. Same motors, same axles, same power electronics, of course. But the energy is not stored in the batteries. The energy is stored as hydrogen, in our case, in tanks on board. And then you have the fuel cell here in the center converting the hydrogen into electricity and water and heat. Heat is a challenge for these vehicles. We need to uh, cool off twice as much heat energy on such a vehicle compared to a diesel vehicle. So thermal management is one of the coolest technologies right now when developing these kinds of vehicles. Who would have thought about that 20 years ago? So you should definitely recommend your students to focus on thermal management. There will be plenty of job opportunities in that area. We uh, uh, saw clearly that the fuel cells as such, when you convert hydrogen into electricity, 
will be key and nothing was available on the market. But to develop something like that is a huge effort and to produce them in a cost efficient way, humans cost matters. We needed volumes, higher volumes than what we intend to use. So we teamed up with one of our main competitors, Daimler Trucks, and started a joint venture called Cellcentric, where we together are going to develop the fuel cell systems, develop and produce, and then we will install them in our vehicles, they will install them in their vehicles. And on a vehicle level, we will be fierce competitors, and on a component level, we have a joint venture together in order to take us from the brown platform to the green platform. To do that, partnership is necessary. New infrastructure is necessary in order to get this going. That goes for battery electric vehicles, for charging. It goes for refueling of hydrogen vehicles. This is an area where collaboration also is extremely important. And to create a momentum, to really get it started when it comes to charging for commercial vehicles, because it's not available today. We have set up another joint venture, this time together with both Daimler Trucks and Trayton. You know, Trayton owning Swedish Scania and German MIN. So together, all the three of us, we have set up a joint venture with the intention to roll out 1,700 charging points for heavy duty vehicles along the European highway corridors. This will definitely not be sufficient in the long run, but it's a starting point and we, we definitely want to have more actors jumping onto this. I talked about hydrogen in fuel cells, but we also believe that hydrogen can play a role when it comes to combustion engines. This is a photo from one of my engine test cells where we are burning hydrogen into a combustion engine. And that's uh, given then that the emissions out of this engine is CO2 free because you don't have any carbon at all in that combustion. Then. Uh, still challenges from an engineering perspective. I call this a wild card in the portfolio. No industrialization decision yet, but rather promising, but with some technical challenges to overcome. But hydrogen in fuel cells and maybe hydrogen in combustion engines, then the question is, of course, will there be hydrogen available? Will there be green hydrogen available? Will there be cheap green hydrogen available? And my simple answer to that is yes. And why can I be so confident in that? In the past, when we talked about uh, fuel cells and hydrogens, I felt very very isolated because there was not so much talk from other industries, but today is the other way around. Today, the demand that is generated in the hydrogen society, hydrogen economy, is not mainly coming from transport. It's coming from other base industries, for example, the steel industry. We are working very, very close to the Swedish steel company SSAB. And I think that many of you are aware about their initiatives also in the hybrid consortia to produce fossil free steel using hydrogen in the direct reduction process. So SSAB and other players, they will need a lot of hydrogen going forward. Less than 10% of the hydrogen going forward will be used for transport. We will just piggyback on a massive infrastructure build out when it comes to hydrogen. We will use fossil free steel in our vehicles. We have delivered the first yellow machines to customers. We will use um, the green part to the right in our electric heavy duty battery trucks. We will use fossil free steel in what we call the side members in the frames. A very heavy component. Then. Here we are first uh, manufacturer in the world to use fossil free steel and we are very proud of that. I often get questions about this, the split between battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles. And uh, it will be very, very much depending on availability of electricity and or hydrogen in different parts of the world. In many parts of the world, power grids and the distribution of electricity will be a challenge, definitely. 
And just so that we get the magnitude right, what are we talking about? Charging heavy duty vehicles going forward will need fast chargers of levels of 750 kilowatts, 1 megawatt. And we made simulations in big Stockholm area. It will be rather realistic to think about that 1000 trucks will charge simultaneously across the day. And that simple mathematics then 750 kilowatts times 1000 at 750 megawatt when I made it. See some of you nodding. 750 megawatt is approximately the output of one of the nuclear reactors here in Sweden. Just to get the magnitude right, and then you need to distribute this to the truck stops where we will need it. This will be possible in many countries, but it will be very hard in many countries. And then uh, it is so that in many countries where they have a weaker transmission uh, uh, grid, uh, they have rather much histories when it comes to pipelines. So either you can reuse or you build new pipelines for hydrogen in many countries. And um, we also know that uh, 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 that uh, let's take that one. We also know that many wind parks uh, are planning to co uh, to convert the electricity to hydrogen already out there at the source and then transport it into the inland uh, as hydrogen. So this is a little bit my uh, speech or my reasoning around why I believe that we will have both. It's not either or, and there are uncertainties in both areas, but we need to invest in both. But coming back to this slide, uh, and here I know that I'm a little bit now into the first or second seminar in this series, but this is of course for a society the big challenge. Uh, if we were 2019, we were on something like 27,000 terawatt hours in the world. We need to go to, this is two scenarios from the Energy Transition Commission where we are members. The positive scenario in the middle there is if we are working with energy efficiency, then we just need three, four times more en uh, energy. If we don't, if we just go on as we do today, then we need five times more than today when it comes to electricity. This is, of course, the big challenge to society. Offshore wind parts, solar, solar farms, the global energy landscape and the power balance will change. Countries like Australia, Algeria and Nigeria have ambitions to be global players when it comes to electricity, when it comes to hydrogen, and they want to export. New players, but also existing big players when it comes to energy, like Saudi Arabia, have clear ambitions to remain a main player in this field. This development will of course be very exciting to follow and um, so far you have not heard me talking a lot about energy efficiency but more about electrification but let me be clear on that that an electric truck an electric vehicle is much more efficient than a truck with a combustion engine. A reduction of more than 50% if we measure it in kilowatt hours per kilometer. Much more efficient. And there are several simple reasons for that. An electrical drive line has higher efficiency, even though there is waste in the power electronics. I give you that. It's still much more efficient, definitely. But there are other advantages and challenges for our engineers when we now go electric. Um, one, one area is, for example, downhill driving. With a combustion engine, you do it for free by using the engine brake. But in an electric vehicle, you gain energy going downhill. And I can tell you going downhill with a 44 ton truck <laughs> and brake it uh, and uh, recuperate it, it as electricity, it's a true power generator. And it's a challenge to my engineers to think about how to cope with this. I mean, when the battery is full, what are you then going to do then? How are you going to break the vehicle? And how are you going to optimize then the use of electricity on board of your vehicle while driving uphill and downhill? Yeah, there is a lot of possibilities now in control systems and optimizations. Utilizing map data, use, utilizing all your auxiliaries on board on the vehicles. When you reach the crest of a hill and you know that you have a downhill in front of you, then you principally should reach the crest, 
with CR in your batteries. <laughs> and then when you're down the downhill, you should be fully loaded then. I have a use case in Spain. We are down every year in Spain for summer test driving in Sierra Nevada. There is a marble quarry up in the mountains and they transport their marble down to the harbor in Almeria. Up and down, up and down. They go up with the trucks without any load. They load the marble, full load, and they go down to the harbor. They will be energy positive if they go electric. It's interesting, but this is opening up a completely new world for our engineers to work with energy efficiency on the vehicles. Then. And that means how much... Uh, uh, how important it is to have a good team on board in working on these exciting topics then. So I have been in this industry now for 30 years. Uh, it has never been so tough as today. It has never been so challenging as today. It has never been so easy to make strategic mistakes than today. But it has never been as fun as today. Thank you for listening. Thank you.